five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. You can see we got cold weather now. I'm back to the bobbing head, which I always like, but my style consultant says is weird. <laughs> I've always thought of myself as kind of a disembodied head. Uh, let's dive in. I got a really good one at the end here, so hang on. We had a lot of fun yesterday, a lot of comments. Thanks for the thumbs up. A lot of comments from uh, the field and a couple of new people joining the WDMA for the $1,500 offer. What an offer. I forgot to tell them what the value of the offer was. You join as an individual, you get a $500 free gift profile for your clients. We'll see how that works out. We really are excited about WDMA, and, and there's a reason coming up in the talk today. So let's dig in. Okay, first of all, let's go over here to uh, watch the watch the video. And I'm not sure exactly how to get it to watch without. Here we go. The 1966 E-Type Roadster. My father spent three years restoring this car. It is his love, it is his passion, it is his fault he didn't lock the garage. Don't even think about it. Uh, hi, Dad. Been there, done that. With LiftMaster powered by MyQ, know what's happening in your garage from anywhere. Kids. So they recreated, they recreated the, the, iconic garage all glass garage for the famous ferrari in ferris bueller's day out and this time the uh and <laughs> and as usual i don't remember the product they don't say the product name enough liftmaster liftmaster you know that's not a big name and this is a, a problem it should have had liftmaster in there a lot stronger but you know it's a cool commercial i thought it was a lot of fun uh, brought back memories of Ferris Bueller's Day Out. Okay, let's move on to something a little more, more with more meat on it. McDonald's over in Europe put up billboards with a picture of a Big Mac and a bite out of the billboard. And I'm sure they worked really hard at this and spent a lot of money to get this uh, billboard put together, but... It just, again, it seems really stupid to take a, 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 not even a full picture of a burger, but just the bun and the cheese, and it could be anybody's burger. And it might get them thinking about burgers. There's fries, but a, a little hint of the red packaging. And there's one of two burgers on top of each other. I think it's just awful and stupid. You know, comment. Prove me wrong. Okay. Catalog University. I got an email yesterday that Catalog University is closing its doors. It was all online, so you'd think it would be really, it would really have made a hit in the coronavirus. But for whatever reason, I'll call Janie and see. I offered to do my webinar for them as one last gasp. They have 145 classes, and some of them are really good. I did a couple of them. I think those are good. Uh, of course, you know, maybe it's just hard to get people to pay for stuff. I don't know. But for whatever reason, uh, Catalog University is closing its doors, which makes the WDMA even more valuable than ever. And uh, I've noticed Target Marketing has not updated one single article in the last on their, on their web page. I'm not saying... Uh, authors couldn't post so it's it was bought by I think by ad week or ad age and um, I hope it survives but the 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 avenue for contemporary uh, direct marketing content is shrinking and we're one and uh, the Washington DMA is another one and the Cal Kansas City DMA is another and I'm not saying we're the only one in the CADM. Uh, I'll be speaking for in January, January 14th. Um, but even those, you know, I read their newsletters and things and uh, very fancy and very nice. But not very many really hardcore mail uh, offerings. 
and certainly nothing like the webinar yesterday. If you didn't catch the webinar yesterday, it's it's up on LinkedIn as a post, and I trimmed it a little. I didn't edit it heavily. We're going to have a link to it in a day or two. Uh, I want to give a chance to offer it to the people who took the tr time to register because I think they did that nice. So I'll, if you registered, I'll send you. I'll be sending you an email from WDMA this morning. Uh, yet. Okay, interesting. Consumer Reports had 400 people go to 200 some websites and try to opt out of their you know CADM not CADM CCPA how can anybody mix those up CCPA the California Consumer Privacy Act CCPA try doing that fast on live TV um, uh, so anyway the CCPA requires California websites now I, you know I don't know if I mean, like WDMA doesn't have an opt-out. We don't have a list. We don't sell anybody's names, so we don't need one. But if you sell the names, then you're supposed to have an opt-out. Um, we do un offer unsubscribes on every email we send out, and we usually, uh, and it's down at the bottom, uh, right where you'd expect it. And we're actually, we actually have the, the process automated finally for the first time ever. Um, but the Consumer Reports decided that it's inherently flawed. There were a couple reasons. One, you couldn't find the link, but... Um, but another one was that uh, the opt-outs required you to send a uh, send a, a photo ID. Now the reason for that is baked into the CCPA itself. The CCPA um, also allows consumers to to identify the information that a company has for them, which is extremely difficult because, for example. Uh, we work with some major catalogers, and we build a marketing database, and we append, I don't know, two, three, four, five hundred variables to that customer based on their address. It's it's quasi-public information. It's not at the household level. It's at the neighborhood level by zip code based mainly on the Census Bureau. Um, so that that's pretty public. You know, I think we might have paid for it, but it's, you know. Is that that is connected? Uh, not according to the CCP. I mean, that's but but if you want to see all of it, all that we've put together on you, and you're buying history by whether you started on the web, whether you continue on the web, how much at holiday, how much Christmas items, how much toys, how much um, you know, different kinds of uh, just all different all different ways of thinking of products, um, just just. A plethora hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of variables and when you look at it it means nothing because it's all just one two three four five or one two three or whatever it's the scores or it's the actual dollar amounts it's virtually impossible for a human to wade through that and have any understanding of it whatsoever so there's no point in sending it it'd be hard to it'd be hard to pull it all together and that's where we're at as a as a world but there's another issue which is more important, and that is why, why should we send you information on a particular person? How do we know you're that person? That's a tough question. You know, I mean, we're not going to send credit card numbers. We're not going to send Social Security. We don't have Social Security numbers. But we have some important information. But we shouldn't be sending that just to anybody. We should be careful with it. Um, and so... And we don't sell it per se. We just analyze it for the the customers of the company, for them, for their use. But um, you see the paradox here? If we give you the information we have for you, then you have to give us information to prove you're you. And what about 90% of the of the opt-out require, required some kind of photo ID, which makes a lot of sense. And guess what? 90% of the consumers didn't want to send a photo ID, and that makes sense too. Because now, not only do I have what I have, but I have a photo ID of you. So I have facial recognition, and I have all kinds of stuff on that photo ID, right? I mean, you, you could block out some stuff. But if you block out the stuff, how do I know it's legit? It's a very good paradox. And I don't have a good answer. Um, the the uh, 
the spokesperson for for uh, the director of consumer privacy at Consumer Reports said, by default, a lot of data sharing should just be prohibited. And that may be one of the only answers. And that makes the modeling, the kind of modeling we do is much more powerful um, because it doesn't really use that at all. But I see the value in that. And it's a little challenging how to figure out where to go with this. But I'm just raising the issue. Okay, I wanted to get to this article because it's just super excellent and applies to almost every company. Um, why did they buy? Um, this is Peter Cohan, and he uh, said, visit your new customers a few months after they purchased. Ask them, how are you using our software? What use cases have you implemented? What value are you receiving? You, what you learn is tremendously important. Um, and he said very few sales teams do this because they're motivated to get to the next customer. And, you know, I think there's some truth in that. So um, he recommends that you get your customer support, sales support, or uh, pre-installation team to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's always the selling team, and then there's the people that actually work with the client and get it done. And um, he says the, those people are actually probably most trusted by the by the customer and so they're perfect for that uh, don't wait too long because um, and especially don't wait until the the the, uh, the contract is supposed to renew right <laughs> because then it's seen as just another sales technique um, don't do it too soon because you won't know what they won't know what they're doing with it yet but asking why we won the deal or why we lost um, pr doesn't provide reference to how they're using it and um, I, I remember Garen Products, uh, I did some, I did a, like a, uh, a you know, walk-in best practices kind of visit. And uh, they wanted to know what, you know, what the quickest payback I've gotten. And I said, you know, the best thing you could do, print out your customers that were the top 1% of last year. And look up how many of them haven't bought yet this year. It was about March at the time, maybe April, early April. And uh, it turned out that 25% or so had not bought again already in first quarter. And I suggested, I said to the son of the founder, I said, you should call those people. <clears throat> Find out why they're not buying anymore. That's, a, that's another related question. You know, you could have asked, how did you like what you bought? And then find out. Um, and he said, we don't have a phone out team. I said, let, let me say that again. You should call those customers they were the top one percent you know they probably represented 20 percent of the sales and in in about 80 percent of those cases a different person was in charge of those purchases it was as simple as that all they had to do was call and fixed it <clears throat> and generated way more sales than i charged them for the best practices but um the first thing you look for is what value in terms of time people or money have you gained as a result remember yesterday i told you the ai cases i look at don't ever seem to have a payback or a value or anything quantitative keyed into it. And, you know, they really need to ask this question. But um, you'll get a lot of informal success stories, but there's something down in here. Here's the, the unexpected case <clears throat> is the most, imp, the most powerful. You know, sure, the customers will talk about how they use it the way you, the, the way you told them to use it. <clears throat> but oftentimes, there'll be a way to use it that you didn't expect. Um, and it reminded me of the story of Pine Sol. Pine Sol was just yet another uh, cleaner. But because of the pine oils and things, it had an okay, weird kind of smell. And it cut through a lot of grease and grime and stuff pretty well. Better than your average uh, dishwashing liquid. Um, but it wasn't selling at all, and they were thinking of shutting it down. And so the sales manager, the national sales manager, said, is there anywhere that we're doing well? And it turned out in upstate Louisiana, in the middle of nowhere, kind of, they were doing what really well, it seemed like, for the population and everything. <clears throat> and so the sales manager said, let's fly out there and see what's going on. And so they, so they flew into probably Lafayette, and the salesperson picked them up, and the sales manager said, well, let me see what you're doing. Let's just make some sales calls together. And so, uh, and so they did. And uh, the, the salesman drove past the, 
the grocery stores and drove past the pharmacy and the convenience stores and went past everybody. <clears throat> and the sales manager was like, wait a minute, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, this, is, this is our market. And the sales, salesman said, well, yeah, but they already have, you know, dozens of cleaners. Nobody needs a cleaner that's in there. They got plenty to choose from. And then he pulled into a gas station. He said, and the sales manager, you know, like, do you need gas? And it, this was a service station in those days. And he said, no, let's go in here and talk to this guy. And so they talked to the owner of the service station. They said, and he had bottles of pine salt sitting out on his, on his counter. And uh, the salesman said, hey, what do you think of that stuff? And the, the, the guy said, it's great. Uh, it's the best thing I've ever used to clean my hands after the after work. You know, it's it's you know it smells like kind of like a pine tree, but it's better than you know the gasoline smell that I bring home every night. You know, my wife thinks it's a lot better, uh, but it also works on vinyl tops, on tires, on upholstery, you know, on leather. Um, it works on grease spots on the floor. I mean, this is the greatest thing we've ever had. Uh, for cleaning <clears throat> and I recommend it to all my customers especially those who work on their cars so pine saw from that you know from that one salesperson from that one anomaly entered a whole new market like men's grime cleaners you know especially targeting men and and petroleum mess greasy mess junk that men need and uh, it's still around today um, and that is what this, these conversations can do. Now, there's also another factor here that, that the author doesn't know about because their focus is customer service. But in our modeling process, I've touched on it a little bit, and there's some videos out there, and I'll, maybe I'll try and find one to link it to this. But in our modeling process, it's 100% transparent. <clears throat> so we might throw 500 variables at the wall. But every now and then, we'll see some amazing success where we didn't expect it or some amazing failure where we would expect it and i can give you illustrations but it's a little hard when uh you know the the freshest ones are from current customers so uh, i'm not going to tell you exactly what we've seen but but this system is explicitly designed to spot anomalies why because just like pine saw and just like this software article <clears throat> the greatest growth explosions occur when you identify a market you hadn't thought of before. You know, another example would be Arm & Hammer baking soda. People aren't baking anymore, but we're still selling. Why are we selling any? Well, people are putting it in their refrigerator. Why? Well, it absorbs odors. Now there's Arm & Hammer baking products, uh, order, odor absorbers. There's deodorant. There's just a whole range of Arm & Hammer. Arm & Hammer had, had a strong brand for odor management. What do you know? It's those kinds of anomalies that drive explosive growth. And that's what our AI system is designed to do. And we have track record over and over and over. I encourage you to Watch the webinar we did yesterday afternoon. It's, it's a post on LinkedIn. You can find it. As I said, we're going to have a, a little more high resolution, more edited one coming out uh, shortly. But just wanted to say that, um, that it was, I think it was the best webinar I've ever done. Uh, we had lots of engagement. It was a lot of fun. So look for the, look for the unusual look for the anomalies you know people think i'm i did, got an mba or i got a, a a degree in stats no my degree's in philosophy and my master's thesis was on disconfirmation natural law disconfirmation in philosophy of science and that's exactly how you get extra, explosive growth you change the paradigm you spot something that you never expected I'm John Miglosh. Like and share. Your friends will think you're smart. <laughs> I'm supposed to say your friends will know you're smart. You you must be smart just for coming here. But share it, and then they'll really know. <clears throat> so that, I'm going to hit stop before I get in. I'm trying to see where I'm at. Have a great day. Bye-bye.